This is a poem by Anne Sexton. There is joy in all. In the hair I brush each morning, in the cannon towel newly washed that I rub my body with each morning, in the chapel of eggs I cook each morning, in the spoon and the chair that cry, hello there, Anne, each morning, in the godhead of the table that I set my silver plate cup upon each morning, all this is God. Right here in my pea green house each morning. And I mean, though often forget, to give thanks, to faint down by the kitchen table in a prayer of rejoicing as the holy birds at the kitchen window peck into their marriage of seeds. So while I think of it, let me paint a thank you on my palm for this God, this laughter of the morning, lest it go unspoken. The joy that isn't shared, I've heard, dies young. These words by Anne Sexton remind us of the simple and ordinary parts of our day that prepare us each morning to face the day and to face whatever lies in our path for that morning and that time ahead. And today we gather as a community to prepare ourselves for our ministries in the world, to prepare ourselves to uh, be followers of the way. So welcome and good morning to our Sacred Juni community. Welcome to all of you who are live streaming with us. Let's gather together and join as a community and prepare using poetry and song and word and scripture. So let's raise our voices, stand if you're able, and let's come to the feast. Let's gather together. One, two, one, two. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, give this end to hunger, come to the feast. Everyone who labors, come to the waters, 
sustain you. Oh, come to the feast. Oh, come to the feast. Oh, come to the Meister Eckhart was a 14th century German philosopher, theologian, and mystic, somewhat controversial in his time, and yet his work has been revived in recent decades by um, people like Matthew Fox and others who are supporters of creation spirituality. For Meister Eckhart spoke eloquently about the imminence of God present in all things. So for our centering prayer and blessing of creation time, we're going to listen to the words of Meister Eckhart. And I invite you to allow these words to center you in this place, in, this chair, in your chair, in this room, and to pay attention to the lovely images collected by Maggie Glenn Burns and the piano accompaniment, accompaniment of our own Mary Louise Knudsen. Let these words of Meister Eckhart uh, center you in this space and allow you to become more aware of the presence of God to the east and the west, above us, below us, within us. I am as sure as I live that nothing is so near to me as God. God is nearer to me than I am to myself. My existence depends on the nearness and the presence of God. Spirituality is not to be learned by flight from the world or by running away from things or by going apart from the world. We must learn to penetrate things and find God there. Apprehend God in all things, for God is in all things. Every single creature is full of God and is a book about God. Every creature is a word of God. If I spent enough time with the tiniest creature, even a caterpillar, I would never have to prepare a sermon. So full of God is every creature. We are all meant to be mothers of God, for God is always needing to be born into the world. Nothing in all creation is so like God as stillness. The eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one knowing, one love. If the only prayer you said in your whole life was, thank you, that would suffice.
Let us continue our prayer by joining together in these words. Let us pray. Holy One, every single creature is full of you and is a book about you. Awaken us to your radiance in each one. Lift the scales from our eyes so that we see you in the grandest elephant and the tiniest caterpillar. For the gifts of creation all around us and for the nearness of your presence, we say thank you. Amen. This is from Philippians 3, 5 through 7, and 12 through 14. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of prosecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials I'm tearing up and throw away, throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone for my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master, firsthand everything I once thought I, was going, I had going for me is insignificant, dog done. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules, when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way, reaching for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And each one of us, each creature, as Meister Eckhart reminds us, is a word of God. So in that spirit, I invite you to greet one another from your God place, your Godness. Greet the God in you, have the God in you greet the God in others. And also, as we move about, I invite you to bring your offering forward if you're prepared to do that at this time. We've got special music coming in later for the offering, so it'll be a different sort of uh, offering moment in our service. Let us share the peace of God with one another.
loosey goosey. It's a bit, well, it is. It's a paraphrase, right? Yeah. So before I um, share with you what I've prepared for the morning, I want to do something we, we seldom do. It just occurred to me it might be good to do it even every, every once in a while. Every week, we have some folks in the room for the first time getting acquainted with this thing we call Sacred Journey, or we have people who are live streaming us, who've stumbled on us and looking on with some interest and perhaps some curiosity. And you may find this experience familiar to you in some ways, to what you've experienced in other church settings, and unfamiliar in other ways as well. And we don't spend a lot of time explaining ourselves. We just jump right in and do what we do. Uh, it occurred to me that it might be a good thing, given that we're about to celebrate our 25th anniversary, to address that at some point. And so I have this idea of creating a frequently asked questions sheet that we might have available. <laughs> And so between now and our actual 25th anniversary, which is coming in a few weeks, I'm going to elicit some input from all y'all about what questions we might want to put on such a page and what we might want to say to people who are just scratching their heads and wondering, who are these people and what are they doing and where did that come from, etc. That being said, I'm just going to go ahead. <laughs> now, if I'd have paid attention to... Uh, to Meister Eckhart as my, my mentor for preparing a message this morning, I would have given everyone a caterpillar 
we would have sat in silence for an hour. And at the end, we just simply would have said together, thank you, and that had been it. Huh? A lot of people here would love that. I know, <laughs> I know that's true. However, I got stuff here. So this translation that we heard, this reading that we heard this morning, comes from something called the message. This is, uh, to be, to be uh, accurate, this is actually a paraphrase, not a word-for-word -word translation. Eugene Peterson, who recently uh, passed away, wrote this uh, uh, paraphrase specifically for the people in his own congregation, and then it's become published and distributed widely, because he wanted people to hear these words in a fresh way that spoke in their language. And sometimes the language kind of shocks us because it's so unexpected. Um, this particular reading from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians is a good example and it includes some very colorful language. So this is a, my paraphrase of <laughs> Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. This is Paul speaking. He says, I'm tearing up my old Jewish credentials. I'm tearing them up, which were impeccable by the way, <laughs> and throwing them out in the trash along with everything else that I once thought was important. I now take credit for none of it. Everything I thought I had going for me is insignificant. Compared to what I know now, it's inferior stuff. It's dog dung. I'm not sure that's the exact word he wanted to use, but that's the one that made it through the editors. So this is Paul speaking, right? Paul, the Jewish zealot who was, as you remember, blinded on the road to Damascus and heard the voice of Jesus. By now, he has clearly undergone a major transformation. He's turned away, turned away from his old understanding, his old convictions. He rejects them in favor of his new life in Christ. He wants nothing to do with them. However well prepared his Jewish roots may have made him for this time. Now, perhaps you can relate to this story if you think about your own life and your own journey. Think back to an earlier time in your life when your religious beliefs and understandings might have been very different than they are now. How did you picture God back then? What did you think about Jesus? What did the Bible mean to you in those old days? Was your family part of a church? What was that like? How have you been transformed in your faith since then? What have you left behind? Perhaps renounced or rejected? And when you think back to that old version of yourself, those old chapters in your earlier parts of your journey of faith, how do you feel about those chapters now? I mean, don't we all feel pretty good about how far we've come? I mean, now that we've done some growing and have matured in our faith, we've evolved, you know, don't we sometimes think that compared to who we were before, you know, we're now, I don't know, better? I mean, seriously, seriously, aren't we progressive Christians just better? Last week, our friend Jada reminded us how easy it is to be self-righteous. Very true. It's like a coin, a coin that we always seem to carry in our pocket, always. And whenever we need to, we can just reach in there and rub the coin of self-righteousness between our fingers and feel just a little smug. Turns out that these fragile egos of ours need lots of reassurance to feel good about itself. And one of the cheapest and easiest ways to feel good about ourselves is to feel better than someone else, even just a little. See if you remember this story. Two men went into a temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was the tax collector. The Pharisee stood over by himself and prayed, Oh, God, I thank you that I am not greedy. I am not dishonest. 
I'm not unfaithful in marriage like some other people, and I'm especially glad that I am not like that tax collector standing over there. So a progressive version of that prayer mud sounds something like this. Oh God, I thank you that I always use inclusive language, that I don't take the Bible literally, that I believe in evolution, that I'm radically inclusive, that I affirm all faith traditions, not just mine. I'm especially glad that I'm not like those conservative evangelicals. <laughs> ouch, ouch. Yes, yes, we have indeed grown beyond old beliefs. Yes, we have evolved and matured in our faith. Yes, we are progressives for goodness sakes, but does that mean we're now better than our old selves? More importantly, does that mean that we're better than people who think otherwise, who espouse things perhaps that we've outgrown or rejected? I don't think so. Evolved? Sure, yes. But better? I don't think so. In fact, I would say it this way. No matter how much our faith has developed, we are no better now than we ever were. No matter how much our faith has developed, we're no better than we ever were. You feel that resistance in you when I say those words? <laughs> Ego hates language like this. Ego resists this mightily. Ego cannot abide the idea that it's impossible to make ourselves better. It's equally impossible, by the way, to make ourselves worse. In the eyes of God, it appears that we are as good on day one as we will ever become. Here's another way of saying it. In idle moments, I take up this pastime of comparing, of sizing up side by side. Uh, here's myself now and myself before. And this is who I could be, or better yet, who I should be. And best of all, how do we compare, you and I? I mean, who's wiser? Who's funnier? Who's thinner? Who's happier? It's a nagging temptation, this measuring, this measuring up, as if there actually existed a scale to weigh and measure a life, to see who's better, who's getting better. One day, I imagined that God had such a scale and decided to lend it to us. Nervously, we all gathered round and each in turn stepped on it, and when we looked closely to our astonishment, everyone's measure read exactly two and a half. Everyone's measure read exactly the same. Last week, Jada had us imagine a banquet to celebrate and welcome all the disparate parts of our inner selves, the unlovely as well as the lovely, our capacity for kindness as well as our capacity to harm to be able to truly welcome the strangers outside ourselves, she said, we must be able to welcome the strangers within. I think the same could be said for all the former versions of ourselves that we have outgrown. The wise thing is to embrace and thank them all. And this, this is where I would disagree with Paul. I don't want to throw my past chapters into the trash. They are not dog dung. Each episode was a necessary step 
along my journey. I do not reject these old parts of myself, my old jobs, my old relationships, nor do I want to judge or reject anyone who happens to remind me of some version of my former self. I was married once before, and then we divorced. About her, I would say this. I would not be who I am now if she had not been in my life. And I would not be who I am now if she had remained in my life. Both are true. I feel the same way about having grown up Jewish. I also spent many years, many years, and lots of moolah, working toward a PhD and planning to become a college professor. It's good that I invested all that time and energy. It's also good that it never happened. <laughs> we live, you and I, in an open-ended process of becoming, of growing, growing in love, growing in awareness. There is just no way to know how far we've come or how far there is to go. We have no basis for judging our own progress or anyone else's. We progressives are no better than those conservatives and vice versa. To be a progressive Christian does not mean that we've arrived anywhere special. Like Paul says in his letter, we're just on the way. We're just on the way. I say I'm a progressive because I believe in progress, which is to say I believe in evolution. I believe in the continuous creative unfolding of everything and everyone. And I believe the engine of evolution is the force we call love. Love is the engine of evolution, which is to say nothing other than this is the limitless outpouring of God. I am not getting better, nor have I accomplished anything that great. I am just riding this wave of love-driven evolution, trying to surrender my scared little ego self to it, cycling through one death and resurrection after another, each, each moment preparing me in some way for the next. Even in the everyday ordinariness of my life, as we heard poet Ann Sexton tell us earlier, trying to keep the coin of my self-righteousness mostly out of sight, tucked deeply into a corner of my pocket, and to my great delight, sharing this whole beautiful, crazy journey with all of you. Thank you. Welcome to the Concordia College Choir. This is conductor Sherry Spear. Mark, would you put the lights back up? They're going to uh, share a couple of musical offerings for us, and then we'll move into our prayer time after the choir sings. So welcome, Sherry. Oh, love, and you might remember it from the Methodist. 
can roll. Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Beautiful text with a new version. And following that, we will sing.
We do indeed live in the never-ending, ceaseless love of God, the love that will not let us go. So you may have a prayer of thank you to offer as we enter into our prayer time, or perhaps you have a prayer of concern, a prayer of hope. So as we center ourselves in our prayer time, I invite those of you who would like to share a prayer for the entire community to hear, to raise your hand, and we'll pass the microphone to you. Let us be in a time of prayer. Um, I would like us to keep Betty in your prayers as well as Bob. For Betty and Bob Beach, let's gather that prayer into our hearts and hold it there and bless it with our love and then together release it, send it on its way to God. Good morning, this is Marilyn. <clears throat> so a couple of weeks ago, I asked for your prayers that my stubbornness would overcome my doctor's insistence on chemotherapy. And after talking with other doctors, um, we are going ahead with chemotherapy, which starts Thursday. And so I hope enough of you are old enough that you remember the old Pac-Man um, <laughs> game. Okay, so on Thursday morning, I hope you'll in visualize the Pac-Man grabbing my cancer. Thank you. I am um, so thankful for the country I live in. This week, the people of one country in Africa remember 25 years ago when 800,000 or more of their people were slaughtered, the Tutsi people, and how fortunate we are and how we must do what we can in our part of the world to share and help them find a way where they are. Please be in prayer for me as we, I do a safe journey to Tennessee this week to be with my family, to be on the farm. It's a bittersweet, of course, but, um, but the prayer is to be safe, but to bring the inclusiveness, not better, but inclusive to the world and to the land. I'm Noel. This is a prayer of thanksgiving. I don't know if you remember the, the saga I had this summer um, with my sister and her uh, abusive parts of her family. She moved out this Wednesday. She moved to another state. Thank you, God. This is Susan. I'm asking prayers for Tom Smith. He is the husband of my birth mother who recently passed. He is in hospice care and is going to try and live as long as he can. Hi, I'm Jeff. I am thankful for 225. That's the number of species of birds that uh, Bob Jansen has found in almost every county in this, uh, in this state. If you read the piece about him in the paper, it was wonderful on Friday, I think. So thank you for Bob's discipline. He may not be a better birder than anybody else, but he sure is the most disciplined we <laughs> know.
Every once in a while, the richness of words can jump out at a person. And this morning, the, the words attached to love as the unfolding of evolution was a powerful thought to me. And also the and, uh, words from Steve, and, and then uh, the words from the choir that talked about joy. And this really startled me and grabbed me, and I, I wanted to share it because I, there are people here who are in pain and have been, and it's an opportunity for us to look to the future if we're in pain, or uh, to look to the past where we've been delivered from pain. The words that the choir sang was, O oh joy that seeks me through the pain. And uh, those are powerful words that speak to me in my life, and I hope they might grab some of you. I have to answer Jeff. <laughs> The sermon today by Steve was fantastic, and uh, it's been a busy week for me. I gave a talk at Carpenter Nature Center a week ago, and Suzanne went in the hospital again with infections, came home. I learned how to what did I learn? How to, <laughs> how to put in, feed antibiotics through a pick line, through a syringe, and, th it, and she did beautifully, and she's sitting next to me, uh, and she's good. My prayer is that the infections, after a year of trying to killer will recede and not come again. That's my prayer. And I also hope that I can get 225 species in Rock County this week. So. <laughs> Let's gather our voices and our hearts together as we pray together these words of this unison prayer. Gather these prayers into our warm embrace, Holy One. had our time of offering and our offering music, and so we're moving right on to what we call celebrations. Um, every week, we take a few moments to uh, find out who has uh, milestones to tell us about in their lives, and we celebrate them together. Milestones like birthdays and anniversaries and beginnings and endings, important events that may be coming in your life around these days, around this season, right now. So if you have good news to share, a birthday, an anniversary, an important event to share, I invite you to come forward. We'll share, hear your good news, and we'll sing you our blessing. Who has good news to bring with us this morning? Uh -huh. Sometimes there is only one, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, spoke too soon. Uh, I have a birthday this week, and uh, it's seven three. Uh, 
Um, from Thursday until Sunday this week, um, the Minneapolis Institute of Art is holding Flower Art in Bloom, where 160 floral artists um, represent a piece of the artwork in, um, in the Institute. And uh, Sally Johnson and myself are entering. We're one of the 160 floral artists this year. So if you head up to the third floor and head west, on the right <laughs> is the Hanukkah lamp, a ceramic piece made in 1989. So come along one of those four days. Be very careful about parking. It is going to be difficult. And enjoy the work. I have a birthday this week also. I'll be 73, four days older than Bob. <laughs> we extend our hands and our hearts in blessing. God grant you many years. many ways to be involved in the life and the work of the community this week. Today at 11.30 in this space, Mark Squire, our Director of Music and Fine Arts, is giving a presentation about interpreting next Sunday's Lenten Reflections concert that the Sanctuary Choir is doing at 11.30. And evidently it's a mashup of two completely different styles from two different centuries. So he's going to explain that and interpret that in a present today, presentation today at 11.30. So you're all invited to that. Pastor Nate is leading a class in the Longfellow Room today at 1 about finding balance in your life, trying to achieve that impossible to achieve balance between work and, and uh, all the other priorities in your life. And then at 3 o'clock in this room, there's a lovely violin concert by Leslie Shank. Uh, we have two upcoming conversations about the future of koinonia. You can read about that in the bulletin with the realities that the church is facing financially and there has been some preliminary uh, consideration of people who are interested in purchasing koinonia. The church is interested in your uh, input and, and um, getting everyone's perspective. So those are coming up on April 28th here at the church and on May 11th at koinonia. So you're invited to um, share your opinions and your ideas about that. Next week is Palm Sunday, so we launch into Holy Week, and you can read the schedule of services that are coming up uh, that week. And uh, one other thing is that since March Food Share was so successful, we Hennepin members contributed four th over 4,000 pounds of food, way over the metric that was set. Pastor Judy has a date with the pool at the Y. <laughs> She's going to be jumping in the pool on Friday. Is this going to be a spectacle? Are we invited? Okay. <laughs> I, I think that it will. But, but thank you to all of you, and congratulations to all of you for contributing so generously to Minnesota Food Share. Nicole? Wow, a record-breaking no-go. That's terrific. A record-breaking donation for Groveland Food Shop. Jan. Bob Jensen. A legend in his own mind. No, sorry. <laughs> Big thank yous to Evelyn, who's standing and wants to say something. Microphone, give her the microphone. Oh, you want the microphone? Yes, good idea. I just want to make sure that all of you that are hearing impaired and have hearing aids with a T-coil in it, 
that you know that we have a system here in the art gallery called the loop. And you can find out more about it either by talking to me or um, Royd over there. Probably if Royd's around, talk to him. But uh, I'm very grateful for it. Very, very grateful because I wouldn't hear very much at all without it. And I don't. So this is the best solution I've ever found. Big thank you to Evie who uh, decorated the table today. <laughs> big, big thank you to Maggie Glenn Burns sitting back there who brought those wonderful uh, images to illustrate Meister Eckhart. And thank you for all of the people who contributed, uh, the greeters, the offering takers, everybody who serves. Also, um, just to follow up something I said earlier, in lieu of our not having a frequently asked questions handout, if you do have questions about what we are and what we do and why we do it, there's a room full of people who would love to talk to you about it. So feel, take it, uh, be courageous and ask questions if you, if you want to. Let's stand, all who are AOL Jean or something. All right, here we go. I want to speak for the food table, the snack table. We have sign-ups up through the 28th, and after that, there are no names on the list. So I um, would appreciate some help with the snack table. All right, to all who are able or invited to stand, let's sing our way out into God's world. The journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. 